Hey guys, Coach Chris here, back with another video. Showing you a Blitz game that I played 38 minutes ago, apparently, on Lee Chess against a 1976. I opened with d4, and opponent responded with knight f6, c4, d6. And here I assumed we were going to transpose into a Slav, but instead my opponent played d6. I thought this might be a mouse slip, it's not like this is losing or anything, but uh, pretty rare. I just played principal chess, e4, taking the whole center, and it was only after bishop g4 that I realized, no, my opponent is just interested in playing nonsense this game, and that's just fine. We respond to uh, any type of situation with just principal chess, so f3, really solidifying the center, kicking the bishop back, and it goes all the way back to c8. And so now, not only will I have the whole center, I will also have a huge development advantage. So I just start developing my pieces very naturally. Bishop d3, knight bd7, knight comes to e2, e5. And here uh, I thought about bishop e3, but I wanted to really prove that the space advantage matters. I didn't want black to be able to trade off that e-pawn and win both the c5 and e5 squares uh, for his pieces. I, I wanted to suffocate black in this game, and so I went with d5. Black played a5 to carve out the c5 square for a minor piece so that it can't be kicked by b4. Just bishop e3, also making sure that the queen can't get active on b6 and developing the dark square to bishop to its best square. And here... My opponent plays knight h5, and again, opponent is really committed to nonsense this game. I have this amazing pawn chain, I've got the whole center, I have four pieces developed, black has less space, only two pieces developed, and he just moved an already developed piece for the second time. I have every right to punish him for this uh, flagrant violation of opening principles, and so I went g4. Um, Queen to h4 is nothing to be afraid of, because after bishop f2, queen moves away, we're just winning a piece. So, knight has to go right back to where he came from, and again, I have every right to punish white here, and I went with h4. The king is just fine in the center, black can't really open it up, and I've already got the center. The queen side is pretty locked, and... Uh, if I can have the center and the king side restrict black pieces, then I just had a great game, and the engine says that it's already plus 2.6. So uh, whenever you're, whenever the material is equal and you're plus 2.5, uh, you know something has gone terribly wrong for one side. Uh, black captures, I recaptured with the C pawn, making sure we've got this nice pawn chain here really restricting black's pieces. Black plays knight c5, and giving up this light squared bishop for the knight is not the end of the world. This is my worst bishop since my pawns were on light squares, and this is his best piece. So giving it up for the knight uh, is, is reasonable, but I played bishop b5, trying to sort of gum up the works here for black. Uh, I expected bishop d7, which has got to be the best and most natural move, developing a piece. But instead, again, opponent is committed to violating principles. Moved this knight again, blocks the check. Now how exactly is this bishop going to develop? And then if the bishop can't develop, how is the rook going to develop? Um, here the bishop is just constant, or excuse me, the engine is constantly screaming, like on this move and for quite a few moves thereafter, to take, take, and push d6. And later that would come with a tempo after the bishop developed to e7, but this is just crushing for white. Um, white's pieces can make use of the d5 square. Bishop literally has no moves, so a uh, crushing tactic. I went with the sort of more natural knight g3. The idea is to i the f5 square, which the bishop has now lost its connection to. Um, again, the king is perfectly safe in the center. There's no urgency to castle to either side. And with the center being locked, uh, the king's just fine there. 
bishop e7 finally, and now Anjan really likes bishop takes e5, um, and this is a is another follow-up, although not in this position because h4 is hanging, so I guess you first play g5, and now let's just say castle, so that shows the idea here. Um, so interesting tactic that I never saw in the game. Uh, bishop e7, knight comes into f5, again it likes that tactic, but knight f5 is still completely winning. Castles, and you know, hard to suggest a move for black there, but castling into the attack. G5, uh, there, there's no reason not to just go full speed ahead here. Knight b6. Queen e2 with the idea to bring the queen over to the g or the h file once we get rid of these pawns. Uh, I really expected bishop takes f5 here, recapture the pawn. And now at some point, f6 is going to come. We're going to open up that king side, and black would be mated. Black opted for g6, and lots of good moves here. I went for the simple knight takes e7, and now these dark squares are permanently weak. I've got a nice dark squared bishop to make use of those. Queen takes, and then castling makes a lot of sense. I got the rook the a1 rook into the game a different way uh, pretty soon. I went with h5 immediately, cracking open the h-file. Um, black lashed out with f5, which is typical when the game is not going somebody's way, but it just helps me achieve my goals. Black's king is on the king side. My king can uh, be safe in the middle, can castle a queen side at any time, and so the opening of the king side favors me, and so I uh, took both the f and g pawns to completely open up the king side, and now I've got these lovely open files leading to black's king. Um, queen h2, threatening checkmate, so black doesn't have time for queen takes f3. Black defended it, and uh, what's funny is that I missed bishop h6 on this move, but failing to win the exchange still amounts to a something like plus seven position for black, or excuse me, for white, which really shows you the power of um, development. So if I win the exchange, I'm trading off this active bishop, and I'm still not getting my last piece into the game. Um, and it actually really likes king e2 as well, because that allows all the pieces to play, and again, these two pieces are not participating and while we're at it, we can also say that these two pieces aren't participating in the part of the board that matters. So this knight can't doesn't have any meaningful jumps. The bishop controls that square. This knight can't go to d3 because the king controls that square. So every piece of white is better than black's, and white has more central control. And white is going to be effectively... I mean, to overstate it, white is effectively four pieces up. If we take away this bishop, maybe we'd say that white is, uh, you know, three pieces up in the part of the board that matters. Anyway, let's keep going. Rook f7. I bring the rook over, which was the plan. Bishop d7. And here I missed a, a really cool tactic. I, w I thought about rook takes g6 with the idea of the other rook coming over and winning the queen. What I failed to appreciate is that if black takes here, it's just checkmate. Um, I was already pretty low on time. I don't know if we can see how much time I had here. I was pretty low on time, so disappointing to miss that uh, really cool tactic, and pretty easy tactic to be honest, but I did, and I traded off this bishop. Still a great move, still completely winning. Not mate, but um, my light squared bishop wasn't doing anything, so I recap. So I captured his. He recaptured knight. Again, the tactic is is still always working. I played knight b5. So in this position, my thought was, you know, there's no need to rush bishop h6. My queen and rooks are already on great squares. The only piece not crushing right now is the knight on c3, and there's a nice handy target on d6. So let's go for it. Black defends with rook f6, still has not moved that a8 rook, and here we are on move 26. Again, pretty good indicator that something has gone wrong. Bishop g5, 
this rook has no squares to protect the d6 pawn, so black decides to sacrifice an exchange here. Makes sense. And here I'm going to win an exchange and a pawn, and I get to choose which minor piece I keep. And this bishop just coordinates so nicely uh, with my pawns on light squares that I went with knight takes d6, rook recaptures, but that rook was pinned to the other rook, and so I can take the d8 rook now. Uh, knight f8, attacking my bishop, I just bring it back. Rook b6, attacking the pawn. And then to really emphasize um, how black is completely busted here, played bishop c1, um, really emphasizing the power of the bishop compared to these knights. This knight looks good, but hasn't actually achieved anything this game. And this bishop um, has been so effective with its long-range capability. Black retreats the knight. I offered a queen exchange since I'm up material, which I was surprised that black accepted. And here I went for what is certainly not the objectively best move, but um, I decided to simplify into a very, very easily winning king and pawn endgame. Well, rook, king, and pawn endgame. Um, yeah, I mean, white's just crushing here. This is a weak pawn. So I have more central space, a uh, protected pass pawn, a rook that will be more active than my opponents. This is just a very easy, no risk win. Played b3. Black played rook d6, and it's extremely important in rooking games to be active. Even if it costs you multiple pawns, you cannot be tied down to passive defense because that's just a guaranteed loss. Black ties himself down to passive defense trying to blockade that pass pawn, but my king is so active, my rook is so active, that it's just never going to hold. Rook h7, uh, just completely dominating this king. The king can never move forward now. Uh, it also attacks the b-pawn, which he moves. I decided to take the open file here, which was unnecessary. It was time to just walk the king in immediately because his rook doesn't have access to the c6 square. So rook c7 was a redundancy. Now I start walking the king in. I have to move the rook again because I foolishly moved it, moved it to c7 and allowed the king to attack it. But the game outcome is never in doubt here. Um, rook b7 this time because I'm going to gang up on the b6 pawn. The king enters, and now black finally follows the plan in rook in games and tries to get his rook active, but it's too little too late. I just take b6. He takes f3. I take g6. He attacks e4, but I can play rook e6 with check, take his pawn, and now I'm protecting my pawn. Um, and, and yeah, it's just over white is three pawns up now. And you don't even have to play good moves in this position. You just don't blunder your rook. And the pawns will eventually win. And again, I'm low on time here. I'm certain this is not the world's cleanest conversion. But again, you don't have to do anything special at all. You just have to not blunder the rook. And uh, here, black decided to resign. Winning the b6 pawn is irrelevant because that allows a rook trade. And then these two connected passers easily promote. And so, yeah, um, pretty nice game. I did miss that mate, but otherwise, pretty decent game. 93% accuracy. 89% uh, accuracy according to the engine for my opponent, is extremely charitable. The game was over almost immediately, um, I mean, right out of the opening. Engine already says plus 2.1 for white after five moves. Um, so again, another game that shows you when you play principal chess, when you control the center, develop your pieces, good things happen. Uh, kind of an extreme example with black's horrible play in the opening but kind of shows how you can accumulate small advantages and eventually build up an irresistible position. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Keep grinding those tactics so you don't have to admit how you missed a really pretty checkmate. And uh, thanks for watching.